Good afternoon. I'm Martin Myron. I'm from the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art, uh, and I'm convener of the British Art Network, which is supporting and hosting today's event. In a moment, I will hand over to Professor Paul Goodwin, who we invited to develop a program exploring critical questions in British art curating. The result, genealogies of black curating in Britain, continues with today's round table. The British Art Network is a professional network that aims to connect curators and create time and space for critical exchange and debate. It is supported by the Paul Mellon Centre, Tate and Arts Council England. If you have questions about the network or any of the organisations associated with today's event, do provide your email uh, and a representative will respond to you after the event. Right now though, I am delighted to hand over to Paul to start proceedings. Great, thank you, Martin. Can we play the video, please? So that was the classic track, Ghost Town, by the Specials in 1981. I wanted to start with this incredible track, not only because it happens to be one of my all-time favorite songs, but also because for me, it speaks to the theme of today's panel about black curators and institutions. Um, and, this, and also to the subject of black curating more generally. Ghost Town was a song that conveyed a specific moment or conjuncture in British social and political history. Post the Brixton riots, in the midst of an author authoritarian right-wing government, and a general sense of crisis and retrenchment. The bleak images of ghostly empty spaces and hollow buildings in the video, along with the eerie soundtrack and vocals, represented an unease about the state of the nation and the role of young people in particular within it. For me, this is a really good metaphor and image of how the very notion of black curating is arguably a haunted one. Curating can be seen as a haunted space or a ghost town for black and brown people working in institutions. In this series, I've argued that the very term black curating is a contradiction in terms, given the terrible history of display and exhibitions in the West, where black and brown people have historically been positioned as objects to be displayed and looked at. The exhibitionary complex that Tony Bennett writes about was one of the many technologies of subjug subjugation and terror used to humiliate, to control, and indeed sell black bodies, black and brown bodies. The question I'm asking then, is to what extent has black curating been an attempt to unravel and to push back against this dreaded conundrum and the contradiction that haunts our museums and public institutions? To what extent are black curators the ghosts in the machine of the exhibitionary complex? And how are black curators used or co-opted the apparatus of the exhibitionary complex itself and turned it against itself? I've often, I've often thought about these haunting questions in relation to my own practice as a curator, both inside and outside the, in, the institution, particularly in relation to the need to develop what I've called a, a position of recalcitrance, to be a recalcitrant curator. The Oxford English Dictionary defines the word recalcitrance as meaning having an obstinately uncooperative attitude towards authority or discipline. Recalcitrance in the way that I use it refers to resisting the call to order or the discipline that institutions impose on us. Whether that institution is a museum, an art school, a physical institution or a discipline or art medium such as curating. The origins of the term, according to the Oxford English, English Dictionary, lie in the mid 19th century and was taken from the Latin verb recalcitrare, which means to kick out with the heels. Um, so at its root, recalcitrance is quite a violent and explosive content, the idea of kicking out. But also, I think in English, it implies a more subtle, stubborn and quotidian form of resistance to authority, of not complying to the rules and regulations, to the way that authority wants us to behave. Black curators, recalcitrant curators, often occupy a role akin to the subversive intellectual in the university 
that Fred Moten and Stefano Harney speak about in their important text, The Undercommons. We are, we are in, but not of the museum or institution. We are often ambiguously mainstreaming, to use Stuart Hall's memorable phrase. We cultivate opacity and push back against racist and colonial structures in the undercommons of the museum. In these circumstances, curating often becomes a kind of Trojan horse, a form of disguised activism in some ways. Um, and these are some of the questions that I, I, I hope that we'll address in today's session with our esteemed guests, who I'll introduce very soon. I'd like to briefly reiterate the purpose of the gene genealogies of black curating project to help us frame this session. So if black art is now a relatively established canon or category in British art, albeit a contested one, at least in terms of art historical recognition, how can we account for black curating? Indeed, what is black curating, if it is a thing, and how did it emerge in Britain? This project seeks to address this by investigating the emergence, strategies, and agency of black curatorial practices in Britain over the past 40 years. Genealogies of Black Curating investigates what I want to call the black exhibitionary impulse. So we're talking about the diversity of practices around the staging exhibitions, the building of archives and publications, the linking of activism and community, the engagement with transnational and diasporic perspectives and partnerships that emerge from black curating, which I think has effectively formed a new paradigm in the history of curating in Britain. Um, and, and as I'm, until very recently been, I think, completely unseen. So this is the rationale behind the series in today's events. So today's session is called Ambivalent Mainstreaming Black Curators and Institutions. And there's a wonderful quote by Stuart Hall, which frames the session, which is, quote, when you go through the door of ambivalent mainstreaming, it's a dangerous territory. It's an incredibly tricky territory and all sorts of monsters or ghosts are waiting on the other side to simulate you up. So this observation by Stuart in 2006, I think speaks to the challenges faced by black curators and artists in mainstream institutions and serves as a provocation for this panel. How have black and Asian curators navigated this tricky territory? And how have their practices helped to, to reshape um, our institutions? So I'm absolutely thrilled today because we've got an amazing panel of esteemed um, curators um, and artists who I'll introduce now. Firstly, we'll have Dr. Nima Puvaya Smith, OBE, who's a curator, writer, and speaker. As director of Alchemy until 20, 2019, she undertook major artistic programs in partnership with cultural, academic, and public sectors. She's contributed to numerous publications on subjects ranging from contemporary art to Indian jewelry, textiles, and curatorial practice. Her recent projects include a sense of a sense of line on the drawings of um, poet and artist Imtiaz Dakar and Black Water's Heritage for Phoenix Dance Theatre. Nima's role in building Bradford Museum's acclaimed textile collections was justly celebrated, along with the work of six other curators in the exhibition Unbound at Two Temple Place in London in 2020. Nima is currently Senior Visiting Research Fellow in the School of Fine Arts at Leeds University. Nima will be followed by, followed by Mr. Mark Miller. Mark is Head of Programme and Practice, Learning and Research at Tate Modern and Tate Britain. Mark's role is focused on the vision, strategy, direction and outcomes for creative learning programmes, which enables access, participation and contribution to British culture through the Tate Collection and exhibitions. Since 2006, Mark's work at Tate has been respons responsible for establishing, creating and implementation of programmes, projects and events, both national and international, such as the acclaimed circuit programme, a four-year national programme connecting 15 to 25 year olds to the arts in galleries. Other recent projects that Mark has um, undertaken include the Hyperlink Festival, Undercurrent, part of the Tate, the Tanks Art in Action programme, and the Turbine Festival at Tate Modern. And then we will have Jelaine Tawadras. 
in who is the chief executive of DAX, a not-for-profit visual arts rights management organization. And Jelaine is the co-director of the Art360 Foundation, which she established in 2016. She's a curator and writer, and was the founding director, of course, of the Institute of International Visual Arts Innova in London, chaired by Professor Stuart Hall, which over a decade achieved an international reputation as a groundbreaking cultural agency at the leading edge of artistic and cultural debates nationally and internationally. Jelaine has written extensively on contemporary art and has curated a number of international exhibitions. She was the first art historian to be appointed to the Blanche, Edith and Irving Laurie Chair in Women's Studies at Rutgers University, um, at Rutgers State University of New York in America. She's the chair of the Stuart Hall Foundation and trustee of the Stuart Cross Foundation. And her most recent book, The Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon, Global Perspectives on Contemporary Art and Difference, is published by Bloomsbury. So can I ask our first speaker, Dr. Nima Provider Spiff, to address us with um, wisdom today. Thank you, Nima. Thank you, Paul, and hello, everybody. Here be dragons. When you go through the door of ambivalent mainstreaming, it is a dangerous territory. It is an incredibly tricky territory, and all sorts of monsters are waiting on the other side to assimilate you. The Stuart Hall provocation, typically rich and multi-layered, can be read as an inspired turning on its head, consciously or unconsciously, of the phrase, here be dragons. In medieval cartography, uncharted areas were viewed as perilous. It was common practice to illustrate the unknown with dragons, sea monsters, and other mythological creatures. Interestingly, these territories were usually at the extreme edges of the continent of Asia. The othering is unambiguous. Hall's language resonates with that of fairy tale, fable, and myth. Uttered 15 years ago, it provides people within the arts world, present and future, with words that are almost talismanic, part prophecy, part warning, and curiously, for me at least, part reassurance. The danger it implies is not exclusive to one individual. It is part of a collective experience and thus subject to the welcome and formidable light of intellectual scrutiny, analyses, and judgments as exemplified by this particular webinar. When I first went to that portal of ambivalence 36 years ago, I'd hoped it would be a magic casement to ambivalence's antonym, comforting certainty. I did sense submerged challenges. The situation in the country was volatile. My post with Bradford Galleries and Museums had been partly created in response to this volatility. However, this was offset by the thrill of embarking on what seemed and is an exciting profession. I like the fact that so much of curatorial research was about untangling mysteries and seeking truths, relative though these may be. Overall, at that point, I was unafraid. Maybe this was foolhardy, but there were mitigating factors that fed into this optimism. There is inevitably an obverse side, and I will come to that later. My formative years were in India. When you grow up surrounded by people with expectations of you, confidence can flourish. For a while at least, this can stand one in good stead in an adoptive country. Working for a regional museum rather than a large national institution also helped. It felt more familiar. I dealt with large national institutions from an early point, but not being part of their workforce or payroll meant that this was from a position of relative equality. Frankly, working for a national institution as my first job would have daunted me. Not all of us have the fabulous intrepidity of a Jelaine Tavidras, for instance. There is also an element of luck involved. I work with some I worked with some principal colleagues with a genuine interest in wanting to learn and change things. Not all colleagues, as I was to discover later, were as collegiate, but nonetheless, that was a promising start. Above all, what buoyed me up was the exhilarating connection 
forged with a cross section of Bradford's diverse communities. Within a month of my being in post, we had a consultation session, dull phrase for such an electrifying event. Food, ideas, and generosity flowed. I felt welcomed and galvanized. Over the years, of course, I've had many lively disagreements with various individuals from these constituencies. However, friendship mainly prevailed. Moreover, some of these individuals continue to be my friends to this day. I was very touched when one of these friends texted me a copy of the invitation of that first historic encounter in January 1986. That session, so very early in my curatorial career, brought home to me the importance of networks, local, national, international, across disciplines and across cultural divides. Now here are four very different experiences, stroke examples, all drawn from the 21st century. They indicate that while we may have moved forward in some respects, trip wires still abound. It would be reckless and unintelligent to think otherwise. My first example, I fear, may be a very common one. It strikes at the very heart of not respecting intellectual property and the dangers of being casual about protecting copyright. Excision, that's what I call it, AKA, writing you out of the story. I curated a major four-year redisplay of the permanent collections of a particular museum. It excavated connections between people and objects across different centuries and cultures, highlighting links that were not immediately obvious. A thematic display provided a framework within which to explore these intricate interwoven threads. The political, cultural and social subtext that surfaced as a result enabled people to think again and look again. I conceived the project, produced the incredibly complex interpretation program, which had to demonstrate a coherent and credible narrative and raised most of the funding. Without too, putting too fine a point on it, I think I was the driving force. After it was launched, one of the leading industry journals commissioned a review of it. I shrugged off my mild surprise at not being invited for even a brief conversation. It was a good review, and whilst it listed everyone in detail, including the quantity surveyors, there was not a single mention of my name. To actively refrain from mentioning me at all would have taken admirable energy and commitment on the part of the person from the organization that the reviewer had interviewed. The next one I call diminishment, AKA putting you in your place. At a funeral of a much loved colleague, I was hailed by someone from the distant past. This person had been a curator of textiles in a Northern museum decades ago and was now a consultant specializing in textile history. With magnificent aplomb, she stated casually and in passing that of course I had been taught all that I knew about textiles by an erstwhile English colleague. Yes, I had had a few sessions discussing textiles when I first started with this very knowledgeable and helpful colleague. However, I had then gone on to develop a considerable body of independent research, writing, acquisitions and commissions, particularly on textiles of the subcontinent. Hey ho. Opining and patronizing, aka London looking down on the regions. Here I include some artists and curators of color as well. They will opine about your work and do not hesitate to voice their views, sometimes in scholarly publications, without bothering to check facts or errors of interpretation. Dismissive and disbelieving when the actuality, not by me, is presented to them. I hasten to add that some of my best friends are from London. Extraordinary terminology, aka ludicrous reading of a work. Amrita Shergill, who died tragically young, aged just 29 in 1941, was one of the founders of modern Indian art. Part Hungarian and part Indian, she trained in Paris and then went to live in India. The people she included, uh, the people she painted included both European and Indian subjects. There was a major and rather splendid show of her work in this country about 14 years ago. One information panel, however, leapt out at me. It proclaimed, 
Her early work often reflected the academic style in which she was trained. However, she also began to experiment with ways of representing the non-Western body. It was unclear what the curatorial intention was here. By using the prefix non, the Indian body is defined through negation and absence. Non-Western body implies a hierarchy with the Western body at the pinnacle and other bodies classified almost as a subspecies. Continuing with the analogy of the fairy tale listed earlier, dangers lurk in unexpected spaces and places, including, of course, in the territory of the mind. However, fairy tale heroes, whatever their gender, do not venture out completely unequipped. They may have magical incantations, a modicum of courage, the ability to learn from their mistakes, the willingness to embrace change, however uncomfortable, an astute ability to scent danger and deceit, and a moral compass of sorts. So while monsters may lie in wait to pounce on the unwary, we can fortify ourselves. Anyone going through that door, paused in that state of liminality, should not do so blindly. They need to protect their physical and mental health. It can be stressful and isolating. So this watchfulness of a well-being is important. There are finely calibrated judgments to be made. Caution needs to be balanced with openness and resoluteness with flexibility. Networks need to be nurtured. They can provide a rich reservoir of allies, but it would be counterproductive to have allies who support you blindly. To be really effective, the networks need to be diverse, socially, culturally, and professionally. I have found the best connectors are the people who are the least like me. I mentioned incantations earlier. I was not completely joking. Considering the multifaceted nature of our undertakings, when we go through that door, developing a vocabulary that is lucid while succinctly and authentically capturing our thoughts and intentions can be a powerful tool. They help us articulate in compelling ways what we wish to convey. We are fortunate that there is such a wealth of excellent writing on cultural theory, present company not excluded. However, this has to be used with care. They're of no use if only partially understood or not customized or contextualized to your particular situation. Nonetheless, there is something powerful in tapping into a lexicon which has currency and freshness and one which you have underpinned with further meticulous research. There are no shortcuts. There is then the reality of how things work on the ground. They might appear to be a chasm between cultural theory and the practicalities of delivering your actual work. Creating genuine pathways between theory and practice can be one of the most exciting and rewarding experiences of your life. In conclusion, yes, here be dragons, but here may be dragon slayers as well. Stuart Hall is definitely one. He does not draw blood. His words and ideas are his lance and shield. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nima. Um, Mark, when you're ready. Hi, all. Good to be here. Um, so um, whilst I speak, um, there'll be a slide which has a collection of images of um, my work as an artist and several um, images of projects which I'll speak to some um, whilst we go through, of course, slightly briefly with um, the time we have. So I approach work within the institution through the sensibilities of uh, a practicing artist. Um, I think understanding the processes of artists go through in approaching and resolving work, um, the ways in which artists may think about representing memory, um, also their own culture and their artistic values. Um, you can see some of my early work, which looks at um, alchemy, superstition, duppy culture, um, duppy city, which considers the intersection between uh, Jamaican folklore and Black British urban cultural context. Um, my most recent work um, after residency at Hangar, which is a art and research centre in Lisbon, what remains um, 
which is the theme of these works, uh, are sound and visual works rooted really in the remnants of Jamaican artifacts um, in a changing digital world. Um, my work at Tate really looks at multiple platforms, objects, materials, network thinking, digital and online uh, formal and informal formats. With this, really, I really aim to um, provide encounters that facilitate a physical, emotional and intellectual experience that supports uh, a transactional bridge of art, people and place. Um, fundamental to the practice is the acknowledgement and identification of points of transition and points of connection and relevance that really look um, to take place uh, in identifying and really facilitating a journey of understanding and knowledge exchange. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, three projects, as mentioned, which I'll speak about briefly. Um, the first one of those is Stolen Sanity, which um, was delivered in 2007, worked with artist Faisal Abdul Allah. Um, we explored themes of dissent, liberty and revolution at Tate Britain. Um, and it was in relation to the 1807 um, abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. I really want to mention this project just to highlight the hierarchies of production within galleries and museums. So in terms of what is collected, archived and why. Um, within this project, really large scale images were produced uh, with, uh, in collaboration with young people. The large scale images were displayed in the ambulatory galleries at Tate Britain, which um, was quite unusual for uh, these projects, which were based on artist projects in collaboration with young people. It provided a really um, good visibility for this work. Um, the project highlighted to me many questions surrounded acquisition processes, um, archiving, authorship, um, which also shone a light on the complexities and processes of defining differing forms of value within a national um, cultural space. The next project um, I wanted to talk about was uh, On the Current at Tate Modern in 2012. This was part of the Tate Tanks Art in Action program. Um, the project really worked with several artists to engage um, predominantly young audiences. Um, On the Current aimed to unravel the processes of influencing mainstream dominant culture um, below the surface or um, in a less visible way, um, pretty much touching on some of the points that Paul made earlier, but um, with impactful, an impactful way of um, influencing the mainstream. Um, I'm going to talk about Count Off to Eo Ipso by um, artist um, Leo Isomoto, which was part of the Undercurrent program. Um, which is a really good example of an ambitious project that illuminated the aims of the Undercurrent program, um, which was aimed to set the boundaries of media, um, performance and visual arts, really setting a space which allows the artist to consider and develop um, multi-dimensional work. Count Off to Ipso um, was a conjunction of uh, live artwork um, multiple cameras, duration, screens, replays, um, involving two acts that occurred um, simultaneously. The project explored the relationship between uh, architecture, religion, um, material and means to look as a means to locate um, and construct and record um, culture. The performance presented a framework of objects and materials that formed an improvised meeting point for the artist, um, the participants, uh, audience and art. Um, the next project I want to talk about is um, 10 Times Tate, which was a project um, which took place at Tent Rotterdam um, in collaboration with curator 
uh, Yessa Van Austen. Um, the artists included were Charles Langfruit, um, Maha Wyman, Bafik, uh, Yem Asawil, um, and uh, four Tate Collective producers. Um, the project's first phase in Rotterdam aimed to really unpick the hierarchies um, or the hierarchical structures of systems um, and explore the, the cause of these systems and structures as well as the relationships they hold. Um, the second phase of the project led to a publication um, which was um, titled Where Does Culture Happen? Um, which really questioned the repository approach in, a predominantly, vis in predominantly visual arts organizations. Um, it really focused on evolving, on the evolving variety of cultures that surround us in all aspects of our lives and experiences in society, um, but really focusing, focusing on what takes place outside of these formal cultural spaces. And I would, what I'd say um, consistently, I think throughout many of these programs um, and the work that, that I do, is just this, uh, the question of quality is always present. Um, quality or qualities of, authentic, of authenticity or the aim to represent uh, the cultural capital of black and POC experience um, as purely as possible um, within these spaces qualities in production, duration, material, um, the sharp awareness of the quality of representation, the how and the what, um, as well as the points of blurring the edges between the personal and the professional, um, quality in who we select and why. Um, I'm going to coin a phrase, uh, positive disruption, which comes from uh, the circuit program, which is a national program um, ran with 10 galleries. And this phrase came out of some work that we were doing with the gallery Mostyn. And it was this frame of positive disruption, which really stuck to me. And the idea is just this idea of uh, non-assimilation, um, understanding the structures, uh, the codes and processes of cultural institutions knowing what you can and cannot change, um, the presence or representation of race, class, lived cultural experiences as dominant positive disruption and a positive clash of cultures. Important to this um, are codes and encounters. On picking the codes of museums and galleries, um, producing encounters with art and space and people that disrupt these codes. Um, this also provides space to develop a clear sense of what the reciprocity through partnerships and collaborations might be, um, how you prioritize or make equal the relationship between audience art and the connection to lived social, cultural and political experience. Um, the art object does not come first, but in an equal part um, that enables uh, response, um, exchange, knowledge sharing and engagement um, to take place. I often ask, um, what is the real relationship that we want to have with museums and galleries or repositories of this type? Uh, what are we really asking for within these cultural spaces and why? and will it ever be possible? Um, there's an inherent challenge for museums and galleries um, to ask and answer the question of what will we, um, or what are we willing to give up? Who are the current systems and barriers serving to protect? Um, and why uh, they have been so difficult to shift? Um, and I'll end there and I'll hand over to Jelaine. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I wasn't entirely sure where to begin on the topic of ambivalent mainstreaming um, because there's so many approaches that we could take and roots into this conversation. Um, 
my personal story begins. If I could have this first image, please. This is Sonia Boyce, Talking Presence, 1987. My story begins as an art history student at the University of Sussex and the challenges I encountered when I embarked on an MA dissertation in the late 1980s on the work of three artists, Shitaba Biswas, Sonia Boyce and Lubaina Himid. And the problem was that there were hardly any sources from which to write an account of their work. A scant number of exhibitions, mainly created by black artists, Lubaina Himid and Gavin Yanches, to name just two, and a handful, if that, of reviews were all that existed. So I had to track down the artists and interview them and compile their art histories from scratch. The MA was subsequently published in the journal Third Text. Next slide, please. Which has been such a vital and significant tool in the struggle to disrupt and rearticulate the history of British art. The purposes of this conversation, I've identified four areas of struggle, negotiation, which I want to touch upon briefly. So the first, next slide please, is art history. The point is that the history hasn't been written, isn't a given, and therefore there is a labor and work to be done in writing different art histories from scratch history of British artists from different cultural backgrounds at the same time as the remapping of the geographies of modern and contemporary art. In the late 1990s and early 90s, practically no reference books or critical writings on contemporary African, Latin American and Chinese art existed, and certainly not ones by art historians and critics from those regions. In that sense, Innova was a pioneer in publishing the first significant anthologies of this kind. It was important to provide a critical context for contemporary art. This is an installation view of the exhibition Fault Lines at the Venice Biennale in 2003, with Frank Bowling's work in the foreground, the biggest canvas on the right hand side being Marcia H. Travels from 1970. So these the question is not simply of, of filling in the gaps, but of also problematizing narrow geographical definitions. With the exhibition Fault Lines, which was an attempt to bring Africa into Venice. There are a number of things I wanted to problematize about how you define Africa and broadening that to include not only continental Africa, including North Africa, which is often uh, missed out, but also Africa diasporan artists. And also to draw out unexpected connections, for example, between the post-colonial histories of continental African nations and post-civil rights and black liberation struggles in America. The struggle to disrupt and reconfigure the canon as uh, both Mark and Nima alluded to, is frequently met with resistance. Rhapsodies in Black at the Hayward Gallery and Aubrey Williams at the Whitechapel Art Gallery. There, perhaps surprisingly, the site of struggle and resistance was the press release. In the case of Rhapsodies in Black, Institu an institution that didn't want to recognize the Harlem Renaissance as a key moment in the history of modernism, but wanted to limit it to um, a moment of black art history, of black American art history, of the Harlem, of that location and that specific time to constrain it, tie it in. In the case of Aubrey Williams, the institution who insist, that insisted that in spite of the fact that Aubrey Williams had lived and worked in Britain for 30 years, that he should be defined solely as a Caribbean artist. Won't even go into all the extraordinary influences and dimensions to Aubrey's work, which encompass the music of Shostakovich, um, Carib culture, um, abstract expressionism and so on. So 
part of this disruption and reconfiguring is not just about inserting one or two figures into the existing paradigm, but it's actually of rewriting that paradigm, of rewriting the history of modernism and modernity. And to cite Stuart Hall, who's been cited so many times already today, and who's so important in this context, to think about modernism and modernity, not just as a moment um, of Western uh, 20th century history, but to think of it in terms of the long durée extending back to the histories of slavery um, and empire into the present. But continuous vigilance and labours required, it's a bit like painting the fourth bridge. Diverse art histories are absorbed and assimilated amoeba-like. That often means blunting the sharp edges of critique, radicality and subversion book which I've recently published, the title, The Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon, is an inversion of one of a title of an Orientalist painting by the French Orientalist painter Jean-Léon Jérôme, who painted an image of um, Napoleon looking at the Sphinx having conquered Egypt. And I wanted to inverse that and think about how the Sphinx confronts Napoleon and the different durées, if you like, of the Sphinx having been there for millennia, while Napoleon's domain over Egypt lasted a matter of a few years. The second arena I want to talk about is that of institutions. This is Keith Piper relocating the remains from the CD-ROM and the piece called Caught Like a Nigger in Cyberspace from 1997. Institution building was, of course, something that Stuart Hall excelled at. And he was key not only to the foundation of Innova, but also to Autograph, as well as to many journals and um, centers of study. When Innova came into existence in 1994, there was no shortage of institutions. The problem rather was of what was going on in those institutions, what they were representing, and the narratives, histories, and perspectives that they uh, privileged. I remember an exhibition at the Tate uh, in 2008 called The Lure of the East, British Orientalist Painting. When the curator, and I encountered the curator, and he very proudly pulled out from his bag a copy of Edward Lane's Manners and Customs of the Egyptians from 1908 as the key reference point for the exhibition. My point is that um, 100, over 100 years, exactly 100 years on, um, an imperial text was the context being provided for curating in a modern contemporary museum. This is Yinka Shonibari's Diary of Victorian Dandy from 1998. The series of images that Inva commissioned um, in this series, Diary of Victorian Dandy, was one for which we could find no gallery or museum willing to show the work. What I want to touch on here really was about institutional power to represent, but also not to represent, to silence, to censor, to ignore. Um, several institutions declined to show this work. So we showed it on the London Underground uh, at Oxford Circus Tube as a series of posters, where in fact it was seen by over a million people. Vale, an exhibition co curated with David A. Bailey's in of Sadir and Janan Al Ani, where this work by AS Art Group, The Witnesses of the Future from 1996, and another work by AES was censored by Walsall City Art Gallery. It was the eve of Britain's invasion of Iraq, and the works were deemed to be unnationalistic. 
something, the third area where, that I want to touch on was funding and financing, which is rarely discussed, but which is critical to any curatorial practice. And the intimate relationship between politics, funding and cultural production. When just as Innova came into existence, its existence was threatened by the new then chair of the Arts Council, Lord Gary, who'd been Margaret Thatcher's um, arts minister and who'd taken over the newly named Arts Council of England. It had been the Arts Council of Great Britain and made explicit that this regime saw Innova's existence as, shall we say, not given um, and precarious. Innova secured very little, if any, sponsorship at all in the early years of its existence. This is an exhibition that was held at the ICA in Norwich about the relationship between science fiction and art that referred back to the witch hunts in America, the McCarthy area in the 1950s. This is Gordon Chong, Breaking Tulips from 2015. We also should talk more about the market's relationship to public institutions and the writing of art history, too often seen as somehow pure and untouched by money and finance. The auction houses which opened up in India, the mid nineties were critical to public institutions starting to wake up and pay attention to contemporary and modern Indian art. Final area I want to look at is that of artists. Next slide, please. The title of this collection of interviews with artists comes from African-American writer James Baldwin, who said, life is more important than art. That's why art is important. His point being that art is critical, not in the same way that um, a roof over your head or food on, your, on the table is critical but critical for us to do more than exist. And I wanted to just touch, close by talking about the critical role that artistic act practice plays. Stuart Hall talked about how you have to go to the imaginary to understand a culture and society. And the understanding of artistic practice as an arena of knowledge production has always been at the heart of my curatorial approach. Artwork, which creates new ways of thinking and seeing. Next slide, please. This exhibition, Transmissions and Transmission Interrupted, co-curated with Suzanne Cotter at Modern Art Oxford, was based on the premise that artists disrupt and interrupt the way we see and understand the world. Next slide, please. And this work by the artist Shen Yuan called Diverged Tongue, I, I want to end with. Um, it sort of sits as an artwork at the edge of the gallery space, silent and unfamiliar. And then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, it unfurls noisily and explosively to occupy the whole space of the museum. I'll leave you with that image. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jelaine, Mark and Nima. <clears throat> an incredible archive of practice, of ideas, of theory that, in my opinion, have changed the canon of British art. I guess, and there's so much to unpack, there's so much to unpack there, too, too much, in fact, for one session. But I wanted to really start to go back to Ghost Town. Um, one, because it's a great track, but also because... Um, justify why I chose that track. No, because I think um, it, it marked a particular, to use a Stuart Hall term, conjuncture, a particular moment in British political history, which is remarkably resonant with the present moment, you know, an authoritarian government, um, you know, um, economic crisis. In this case, obviously we've got the corona, corona um, pandemic. But I guess I wanted to start with the context in which you arrived at your practices. Um, what was the wider political institution? Because you came in at very different er different times and periods. 
what was the wider political institutional context in which you arrived at the institution? And um, the other part of that question is, how did you come to curating? You know, what kinds of education or training did you have to come there? I'll, I'll start with Nima. I mean, I know Nima, you were trained in, in literature. So perhaps you could start with the context and your kind of, you know, your trajectory into curating. Uh, yes, my, my first discipline was literature and my specialism was Commonwealth and post-colonial studies. Uh, so there was always an interest in that. Uh, but as part of that, interestingly, when I was in India, uh, the, the, my supervisor had also introduced a strand on Indian art theory and the writings of Kumaraswamy. And so that gripped my attention, even though it was just, you know, a thread uh, in the overall uh, uh, program. And uh, but when I came here, I came to Leeds University to do my postdoctorate. And I, you know, because I married an Englishman, I thought that I would be looking for a job within, you know, an academic institution to teach uh, literature. And, uh, uh, but interestingly enough, someone offered me uh, within the adult education program of Leeds University, uh, a part-time program on uh, the history of Indian art. I, I can't say, you know, I was the biggest expert, but I was willing to learn and I had had some grounding. And that's how it started. I fell in love with that subject. I mean, I'm still in love with English literature, I hasten to add. And, you know, as time progressed and as my projects became more, more multidisciplinary, but in a sense, uh, that, that's how it started. But the reality on the ground compared with what I had in terms of book learning were two very different things. And the thing that bridged it in an interesting way was uh, before I started working for Bradford Museums and Galleries, I also had a one year post as an adult education coordinator, uh, working with communities of Bradford. And that gave me you know, interesting inroads into different groups of people. So that then I think helped, you know, marrying the two together helped when I started working for Bradford Museums and Galleries. So a lot of it is by accident. It was not, you know, a, 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 what you would call a known pathway. What about the wider context, Nima? I mean, when you came in in the 80s, I mean, probably quite similar to what was happening in, in Ghost Town, the video. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it was a volatile right. time and my job was partly created in response to that. Uh, because, you know, the race riots had taken place across a number of areas in England and uh, the, uh, the head of uh, uh, Bradford Museums and Galleries had a very sort of Scottish Presbyterian way of approaching things. And he said, uh, he said to me, uh, you know, uh, we've had Asian communities in Bradford and, some, you know, a much smaller group of uh, African and Caribbean communities as well, who've been diligently paying their taxes but have not seen any kind of representation in terms of the collections and only a smattering of exhibitions. And so we need to change this and we need to tilt the balance, you know, in terms of what we prioritize. I'm sure he faced some opposition, but you know, once he'd made up his mind, then things got going. And of course I had to raise a lot of money. I mean, that's one of the things about, you know, working for a regional museum, it has all its lovely upsides, but you're also doing everything, you know, including your own admin. Uh, so that's how it started. And I was really, I have to say, I made a lot of mistakes and I was very naive as well. Uh, but at the same time, you know, brimming with enthusiasm and a totally misplaced confidence. Sure. Jelaine, um, maybe you can address that in terms of, what the context was when you enter, you entered. I mean, obviously, you you talked about your trajectory as a, a student at Sussex in art history. I mean, when you came into, how did you come into contact with curating, and what was the kind of political economic context in Britain at that time? That well, like uh, Rima, like Nima, um, I actually went to study literature, <laughs> but flips to art history because I spent. A year I was they wouldn't take me I was quite young and they wouldn't take me so they told me to go away and grow up a bit so I ended up working as a trainee technician on a yacht scheme at the photographer's gallery <laughs> so when I got to Sussex and de, de, you know de, structuralism had really hit there was no text in sight you know it'd been, 
Um, so I, I veered towards uh, visual art and, um, but I mean the context, well, there are two contexts. The first is, and they're both connected. The first is the political context. And um, as I said, the, um, I mean, Inova came up, was in gestation for many, many years before the institution was founded. And that was as a result of many, many black artists and intellectuals who are arguing for the need for the practices of black artists to be represented and shown in institutions. So in a sense, it emerged out of a failure. Um, and, you know, Gavin Yantiers was absolutely key to that. He was on the Arts Council um, but it was the Arts Council of Great Britain and it had a different regime um, in terms of its secretary general and chair, which by the time Innova did become an entity um, was now the Arts Council of England. And as I said, had a different chair, different uh, secretary general. And funnily enough, Lord Gary um, asked uh, Stuart and I into his office and, and sort of, uh, and sort of, mulled almost as if he was talking to himself about how maybe Innova could continue existing because there are all these black taxpayers <laughs> and and that could be the rationale um but certainly the ambivalence didn't just come from politicians it also came from institutions who resented Innova's existence and particularly progressive institutions that had shown some work of black artists you know, resent the fact that this institution was now receiving what at that time a million pounds a year was considered a significant amount of money that was being was seen to be reallocated away from them to this new entity. Um, and I remember getting a dressing down from a black artist and from uh, the director of a major institution, white institution, who both told me that I should be totally clear on the fact that Innova was about showing black artists and black artists only, and did I know that? So a kind of part, Nima, what your, your sort of uh, story resonates. There's a constant, <laughs> constant defining, being told what box you should sit in, yes. you know, by everyone. Yes. The constraints oh, yeah. constantly defined. Um, yeah, this kind of burden of representation, which I, I want to kind of come back to. Um, Mark, um, can you just talk a bit about the context in where you came to the institution and also to curating? Because you, your trajectory um, into curating, obviously as an artist, um, was not so much through exhibitions in the way that Jelaine and Numa worked with you I mean you've worked in a as how we met actually Mark <laughs> in, a, in a in an education department which I call the undercommons of the museum you know the, the education department is often the undercommons right it's the kind of place where everyone kind of you know it's kind of fairly ignored but actually some quite interesting things can happen there mm. and I remember at Tate you know we had some we plotted some quite interesting um projects which the curatorial department were actually not interested in but anyway, I don't want to kind of um Thing. just for you in terms of yeah your trajectory and what the context was at that time mm. Mm. I think the, the context at the time was um I don't know I, I, it feels like it was the height of diversity policies and new labor you know so there were lots of things you know happening like Decibel, Inspire you know all those programs were kicking really large you know and how I was introduced and as well was just through an artist friend of mine introduced me to an arts council program called um, the intergallery um education program i think it was something like that anyway this yeah, exactly went on that and it was pretty much <clears throat> a really diverse range of people paul myself claudia you know there's um Rick johnson yeah, monica claudia. miranda yeah and all of us had quite a lot of experience coming from different parts of the, if let's frame it as a cultural sector. Um, so that was like my really, one of my first major introductions to galleries and museums, learning programs, 
um, the idea of collections, um, you know, exhibitions in a deep way rather than as, as, an, as an audience or as an artist. So I was practicing audience or artist. I had lots of experience in um, working with young people who had been excluded from, um, uh, you know, mainstream education. So kind of youth work. As a musician in Manchester, all, all those things, and this idea of sort of a the multidisciplinary kind of served itself quite well coming into um, what at the time was the education interpretation department at Tate Britain. Um, so I always, I, I think I've, I've held that and I've always come to these spaces without the feeling the glory of the canon or. Um, or the institution as, as kind of galleries, museums, Tate, etc. I've not really been a, a museologically trained. I mean, I probably am now, but in terms of when I when I arrive, not at all, you know. So it was quite interesting for me, and I felt like, you know, there were there were some really good programs and really good social justice, radical pedagogy pedagogical approach to learning at, at Tate Britain at the time, which was really strong, you know, and really good um, people like Paul yourself, Vicky Walsh, you know, all sorts, uh, Rebecca Sinka. Um, so that was the context in which I came, which was very supportive, very much about organisational change um, and very much about considering how the status quo could, could shift, you know. Uh, my education is um, uh, coming from, I mean, I'd recently done an MA at Central St. Martins before I, I reached Tate and I studied in Manchester and stuff. So that's sort of my background, really. Right. I wanted to come back to the question that both Jelaine and Nima and Mark raised to some extent, which is around this kind of burden of, represent, this burden of representation, this sense, which, you know, um, um, the sense that as curators of colour, because of our geographical backgrounds, you know, from India, for the Caribbean, Egypt, or, you know, whatever, we kind of bring, in a sense, I feel that we are kind of, to what extent, you know, we are sense translators of cultures. And that's been quite a strong theme of black art practice, um, bringing that kind of diaspora element into British art. And I just wondered, um, how you, I mean, Nima, in your practice, I think I would say, you know, particularly in the early 80s, you were probably a pioneer of, of that in a way that you, in, in terms of your approach to the collections um, and the kind of setting up of the transcultural um, galley. I wondered how you came to that concept of transcultural, you know, um, and how it related to your background coming from India and what the expectations were at that time. You just talk us a little bit about how you approach that. And I guess this question of, you know, how you diversify collections. Uh, well, it was not a neat and tidy process, also in terms of my own thinking, you understand. So it, 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 it gets a bit uh, blurred around the edges. But there were three very clear uh, uh, points in my job description. They said to diversify the collections. They didn't use that phrase, but you know, to increase, particularly at that point, they mentioned they use the phrase South Asian uh, aspect of the collections. And then the second one was to make connections with the communities. And the third was to put on a program of touring exhibitions, both historical and contemporary. So it was really quite a, a wide brief. And there wasn't really uh, that much money for it, but there was some seed money. And uh, so I thought that was jolly good, you know, and I, I could now get started. There were these three things. I took it very literally and very seriously. And uh, so sometimes ignorance is truly bliss because I wasn't expecting opposition. So when I encountered it, you know, I was quite astonished and then thought I'd imagined it and just move on. So maybe there was a bit of a juggernaut aspect to my own way of approaching things. So, you know, if I have therefore trodden or trampled on any sensitive <laughs> sensitivities, I do apologize, but never mind. So, and oh, as I said, I have to acknowledge Paul Lawson, who would be seen as such a maverick curator today. He probably is, you know, politically completely in, uh, incorrect. And he's now 
uh, not very well. So I particularly would like to, because any idea I came up with, he'd get even more enthusiastic about it and say, go for it, go for it. And that's all, you know, you, you just need those little motivate and the, and the communities, you know, and uh, they had ideas, we had ideas, they didn't impose their ideas on us. I made it very clear from the start that they could, you know, they could tell us what they would like to see, but they could not tell us what they wouldn't like to see because that would then, you know, trample on other, uh, other susceptibilities and so on. And uh, so it started, you know, we, we got some money because he, you, you took, this is a regional gallery, remember, we didn't work in the spacious, majestic way that nationals do. So I would be given, I, I would identify a contemporary art object, say Shutta Parbishwas's, you know, Housewives at Steak Knives, I might, just as an example, be given a small amount of seed money from the acquisitions budget. Then I would, uh, you know, match it up with the what was then called the VNA Purchase Grant Fund, and then the Art Collections Fund, and then suddenly I had enough money, and that was very uh, invigorating. You know, the minute you got one object, then you wanted to to build, and then I was also very determined. I didn't actually succeed fully in that, that we shouldn't really have one work by each artist, that we should have three or four works by each artist, which covered, you know, different areas of their practice. But then as I was doing this, like Julaine, you know, being sometimes being put in a box, and I was thinking, you know, it should, it should be about talent, not tint. And uh, there are so many other stories I want to explore. Uh, and it's not the transcultural gallery was just the scratching of the surface because once I'd left Bradford Museums and Galleries, I came back as an external to do a much more ambitious project, you know, which is called, which was launched in 2008. And this is where we were looking at, uh, for, for instance, it came to me as a complete shock that the person who actually was the principal sponsor of Lister, Cartwright Hall, had textile uh, had sericulture farms in northern India. So I thought here was a story to be told because also, of course, the story of textiles, how it became a symbol of Indian independence, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 there's this whole political and social thing lying underneath that. So that became a trigger then, not just for the transcultural gallery, but later on for Connect, to explore connections, to conflate down stories so you could tell them in a succinct and compelling manner. Sure. Um, I mean, Shitapa's Housewives, Housewives Estate now such a powerful, iconic work. Just say a little bit, because I want to. I also want to give space to Jelaine and Mark to kind of come on in this, but just tell us a little bit about that work and how that came into the collection and the story around that, because it's such a, yeah, it's such an important work that, you know. Well, and she created it when she was, you know, just 20, when she was still a student at Leeds University. And this is actually a personal story. I was walking through Leeds University, you know, uh, thinking about something else. And I saw this young woman carrying a very large work of art. And, you know, such was the na naivety of me. I just stopped her and started a conversation. And of course, she just begun to fly. And uh, so that's how it started. And that was not the only work we bought. We did buy other works as well. But that one immediately, you know, uh, she told me, uh, and she's a very compelling storyteller, but also in terms of the intellectual underpinnings of that work, you know, the, the eye mouth motif of that dress she bought in Selfridges, and that actually was taken from something that her great aunt used to use for Durga Puja to, to the goddess Kali. So there were so many strands within that. And here was this young girl also at the same time taking on the art establishment uh, because at that point, you know, she wasn't within her work wasn't within that kind of Western uh, artistic canon, but she actually took them on at that age and, and made them not completely, but made them change some of their, their, their approaches and practice and content. So, you know, how could you not, <laughs> how could you not want to acquire a work like that? But it had so many resonances. Uh, an iconic work. Um, Jelaine, um, in terms of this kind of sense of translating cultures and internationalism, obviously Innova championed the idea of new internationalism. I mean, to what extent, Jelaine, did your kind of own background, trans diasporic background, feed into that? Um, and how did that, how was that kind of, how did that translate curatorially in terms of your program at Innova? Uh, 
Can I just pick up on a couple of things first, Paul, before I start to of answer course that you can. question? Of course you can. Because I think there's something which I didn't say, which is important about the political moment in which Innova emerged, as did many, you know, institutions like Autograph and many artists and intellectuals, which is that black was a political designation. I mean, Stuart talks about this in the New Ethnicity essay. You know, and so, and underneath that kind of signify it was possible to bring together lots of diverse communities and experiences which now maybe isn't possible or is maybe is becoming possible again actually at this moment and i think that's a really really important thing and also that nima um i think pointed the, to this too which is there was something particularly unique about urban spaces like bradford leeds birmingham london manchester which um, were both sites of struggle and hardship, but also incredibly um, catalytic in terms of creative practices and ideas. The other thing, I mean, in terms of my background, I mean, um, there was a conference at, at Tate which tried to unpack what interna new internationalism was, and we actually dropped the new. <laughs> uh, because you know new in relation to what it was a contested term and um it was really actually also referencing uh you know third international and notion of kind of liberation movements which is really important and and powerful um but which were not so easily translated into a into an artistic uh context um but for me the thing i suppose a number of things are important one is that i mean i've always actually was very resistant to the term curator and it didn't exist it's quite a relatively new term i think again we forget that actually people were exhibition organizers not curators um and curator sort of emerged at the same time as this practice became a professional something that was taught in universities and a professional career to be aspired to um, and I think that distinction is quite important, but also important for me particularly was were two things. One was that exhibitions were not the only output. And in a sense, Innova was, you know, the idea was that it would be in a in a building, a sort of Whitechapel type building. Well, the political conditions were not conducive to spending loads of time uh, and raising lots of money in order to create a building project. We probably wouldn't have existed beyond a year if we'd done that. But also it seemed like an opportunity that the concept of diaspora could actually be an intellectual as well as a means of operation. So that exhibitions, publications, education, research, as well as multimedia, and Innova was one of the first organisations to have its own website and to commission artworks for the X space, which um, Gary Stewart convened and curated. Um, you know, that there could be a number of different channels, and sometimes all of those channels, like we did with Keith Piper, um, you know, could be used, utilised, uh, to express something. But the other critical thing was that this wasn't, a, for me, this was a political project, but it wasn't a project about blackness. For me, more importantly, it was a project about Britishness, about redefining Britishness as well as the global and the international. That it was reconfiguring those things um, and challenging the sort of more traditional conservative views of what those those terms designated. Thank you so much, Jelaine. Um, Mark, I wanted to pick up on something Jelaine said, which is about the kind of moving beyond the exhibitionary, uh, the, the exhibitions and into the wider context. I think your practice encompasses very much. So just in terms of what was the context in which you arrived at, obviously as an artist, um, and working around questions of Duppy, you know, Jamaican culture, urban culture, um, youth culture, you know, what was the context at that time in which you were entering the institution and how did that affect, how did, how, how did the, how did the idea of curating fit with what you were doing? Was it a constraint or was it something which was 
uh, you know, was useful? Yeah, I thought it was really useful, you know, because <clears throat> what it did for me or the way I navigated it was just seeing it as a sort of, um, I don't know, uh, a multi-layered platform from which you can pull so many, um, I don't know, different, let's call them materials in a sense, you know, you have artists, space, um, technology, uh, you have the audience and the participants. And I think, you know, there's a kind of distinction between artists, our audience and participants in, in the work that we do in terms of how, um, you know, what role does your participant play within that whole, um, if you want that kind of meeting point. So in a way I found it quite, um, quite uh, exhilarating actually. And I think even, um, you know, now we talk about the constraints of like cultural spaces and museums. I think as I entered them, I didn't really feel those constraints because I didn't have many expectations in terms of, you know, because I was coming from places also like in Manchester, you know, working in certain organisations with very, very small budgets and you enter somewhere like Tate and the budgets, you know, not that they're massive, but they're way, they're much better. So in a way you just think like, okay, you know, the resources are there. So how do you then navigate that? And in terms of how I navigate that as a, as a black man, um, you know, brought up in London, um, Jamaican background, artists and all those things are things that I held really dear to me, both in terms of, um, what I selected and um, who I selected to both work with. And I think that's just so important in terms of, you know, audiences and young people and adults and who we work with within those organisations. It's really important that um, whether it's our colour or class or whatever it is actually really visible. And that sometimes it feels a little bit uncomfortable for the organisation or others, because I think you know, we've all been talking about sort of disruption, you know, and, and in a way, um, I've always felt that, you know, I've had the opportunity to um, disrupt. Some people may not see it as disruption, but actually, I've always felt that I've had that opportunity and that support tape to bring what, um, whatever my cultural experience background is into into that space. Um, what that means in the bigger picture and how visible that is to, to others in terms of the hierarchies of exhibition, curatorial curators and learning curators, for example, you know, that's, that's a whole different story. But I think for myself, I've always felt that there's been space to expand, to, um, to represent, um, to negotiate good relationships, um, and to kind of push boundaries and really one of the big things for me was actually representing young black men in in that space because I remembered myself as a young black man or boy or youth or whatever you want to frame it in London you know and for me there's lots about how we create space within those organizations for young emerging creatives artists etc. Great I mean I could I could continue to ask you guys <laughs> so many questions. Um, uh, Nima, go ahead. I just want to add something very quickly to what Jelaine has said about, you know, treating the whole concept as a diaspora in this country. And I would like to acknowledge that, you know, because of Jelaine, we collaborated over, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without Jelaine, or uh, after, uh, an Afterjeet Dhanjil sculpture and the Zarina Binji Commission. So thank you, Jelaine. Incredible. Um, so, as I said, I, can, I, could, I would love to continue this conversation on, and I, we will continue this conversation in the context of this project, but I think we've got about 20 so minutes and we probably need to get some questions and we're getting quite a lot of questions and great questions from our very um, knowledgeable audience. So, um, I mean, how should we do this? I wonder if I should ask people to kind of say their question. So the first question is from Jill Sutherland. Jill, did you want to unmute and actually say your question or do you want me to read it? 
Jill. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. That was that was really awkward. Um, thank you so much for today, by the way. It's so interesting um, listening to you all. Um, my question was, so I was recently working on a museum project. Um, I'm a woman of colour. And um, during my time at the museum, you know, I did have to deal with constant undermining and sort of watering down of the message of my work, which dealt with colonial histories. And um, I'm not at the museum anymore. Um, that was just because my contract ended, but they are still sort of continuing to talk about it in a very watered down way. So my question is, as people of colour, how do we keep going basically in the face of resistance, which is sometimes really um, painful? Um, and is there a time that we just have to draw a line under it and go, fine, I'll just let it go? That's the question for all of you. Thank you, Jill. Who wants to start that one? I would Elaine. go on, Nima. No, 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 Jelaine, you go on, please. I was going to say, I think I, I sympathise a lot with you and it is painful and difficult. Um, I think not to see, not to see projects as one-off things, but see a practice as something that extends over time. And I think to continue to challenge, I think it's really, really important. Um, I mean, if it's any constellation, I got nowhere with a curator of Lure of the East, who was adamant that Edward Lane was, you know, absolutely the right source for doing an exhibition in 2008 about Orientalist painting and couldn't be, couldn't be swerved from that. But I think, um, you know, I wonder if that could be possible now because things do shift and change and it's not down to you as a singular in individual, it's down to a lot of different people. And it is important, I think Nima talked about networks and I think it is important to, to reach out and find support from other people, maybe in very different contexts who are working and who can provide those networks of support which we all need um, at different moments. Jill, <clears throat> I totally understand. And I would say like what I've suggested to some younger, because um, uh, I work, I worked, I don't work so much with young people is that they should start thinking about setting up their own organizations. Um, and I really believe that. And I think totally agree with them. Um, Jelaine, in terms of like how the knowledge and the experience and the going back to the knowledge that we all know is there and the, the constant going back and circling around the question. Um, and that's why I had that sort of one of my questions is like, what are we really asking those institutions for? And if we spend the next 10 years trying to do that in those 10 years, many of us here, it's you know, and outside of this space have so much knowledge experience that actually we could have built an organization or several organizations by then um, to consider how we want to frame and contribute or not to the canon or build new canons or whatever it is, you know. So I really, really think <clears throat> um, that 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 is, that's the space that many of us who do this work should begin to try and build um, because I still, yeah, anyway, I totally, I, I totally hear what, you, what you're asking and I just um, feel that that's almost the only way, you know? Um, so, yeah. Straight up and down, Mark. Hmm? Yeah. Straight up uh, and down. Nima? Yeah, and I, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, however young you are, you need to be really ambitious you really need to make sure that you contribute as much as you can, uh, you know, to publications, to conferences, so that you have a profile and a presence outside of your organization. That just makes it that much more difficult for them to diminish what you're doing, you know. And of course, Jelaine has already uh, uh, mentioned networks and you know setting up your own organization, which is something I did in the end. So I, uh, but I think you know, start a blog. It, you can do it in a variety of ways, but make your, you know, develop that profile outside of your organization. 
and then it becomes you know just create a context where you become more and more impregnable less and less vulnerable i think great you know i think thank you for that nima i think um this is where the concept of the undercommons i think really comes in in the sense of the undercommon is not a specific place it's a kind of orientation it's a way of not you know being in but not of the institution and thinking about how we create our own spaces but our next question is from another pioneer in the field marlene smith marlene do you want to briefly uh come in and ask this question um i think the, the conversation has slightly moved on from the point at which i asked my question and my question was really um first of all i wanted to express my gratitude to you all to all the speakers because each of you has impacted the way that i currently understand what this expanded field consists of and it, and you've impacted it sometimes through the things that you've written that i've read but more importantly for today's conversation through the the way that you've commissioned work in the face of this kind of institutional challenge the ongoing institutional challenge and um so my question and this is a question that i wrote half an hour ago was about the expanded field that we know today and whether you feel individually that that expanded field is more or less resilient now than it was in the 90s when most of you would, was, were starting to do, to do the work that, you, that you've been doing now. And secondly, how and do we prepare for the next 30 years strategically? Is that work already underway? Look, I can see Jelaine, Jelaine is smiling at this. Do we prepare strategically? I mean, it's, not, um, it's a question, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very much taking on board what we've all said about, you know, the kind of burden of um, responsibility that we can take on as individuals. Do we prepare strategically? And is that work already underway? Where can we see the evidence? And I, and, and I ask this question partly because I'm always, um, I get a lot of inspiration from asking my peers, what is it that you're looking at right now that is giving you life, that is giving you optimism, and that um, we need to be on, we need to understand and see here in the UK or elsewhere in our multiple diaspora. So it's a huge question, but it's like, you know, what are you looking at right now that is, um, that enables you to go on and to do what you're doing. Thank you, Marlene. Jelaine, do you want to jump into that about the expanded field and whether it's more or less resilient and how do we prepare for the next 30 years strategically? Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Marlene. That's a dissertation question, I think. In terms of is it more or less resilient? I mean, I always think about the money a lot, where the money is, how much money is there. And my sense is there's more appearance of investment in institutions within certain forms of practice, but I'm not sure that the percentage overall of investment is any bigger than it was 30 years ago. That's my sense. I'd like someone to do the audit, but that's my sense. And I think sometimes we get um, clouded by the performative presence of difference across institutional spaces. And then if you scratch the surface and really audit it, I, I just wonder whether that has, there has been a structural shift in terms of the level of investment in people and buildings and collections, et cetera. In terms of the next 30 years, well, yeah, to invoke Stuart and the notion of conjuncture, this is a really difficult moment where we've got this two forces, I think, at work. On the one hand, you've got, you know, a 10 year prison sentence. If you fell, if you dare to fell a statue of a slave owner with this new bill going through government and a culture secretary who is basically leaning very hard on museums, if they, um, 
are seen to be promoting a certain deconstruction of colonial histories and so on within the museum space. And on the other, this really, really amazing conjunction and convergence of um, protest and resistance, whether it be Me Too, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ+, you know, just really, really interesting. And, our, and, a, and a generation, I think 18, 19, 20, early 20s, who for my, oh, I think are incredibly powerful and the climate change as well, you know, incredibly powerful, incredibly articulate, incredibly astute, and who are actually not just building new institutions, but actually thinking radically about how to do things differently. So thinking about, you know, challenges to hierarchical ways of working, reinventing the idea of the collective, you know, just, just really, really, I think, fascinating. So that's where I'm looking. And, you know, I chair the Stuart Hall Foundation and, 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 and the driver for me there is, you know, how do we create ways to empower and enable new generations of thinkers, artists, uh, and that's what we, I think that's the responsibility. I see my responsibility right now, you know, is to empower and enable future generations. Thank you. Uh, Nima or Mark? Okay. Uh, my answer com is, uh, it's, it's only a partial answer, if I may say so. What I would like to say as a 30 year strategy is a much, much more comprehensive representation of artists of color across all public institutions. I don't think there is a sufficiency of that. It is one of the sadnesses of my own professional career that I was not able, you know, because of by the time I left, I was not able to build up as much, you know, works by artists from the African and Caribbean diaspora as I was with the South Asian. And even the South Asian has huge gaps. But when you look across the country, I think that is quite pressing because if they're not present, if we are not present in those collections, then, you know, huge swathes of critical art history has been lost. And it is so important, I think, not just for younger generations of color, but for the country as a whole to have this representation. And I don't think there is any such, you know, targeted move towards building that up. Mark, thank you, Nima. Mark, we've got the comments. You know, <clears throat> I just think Marlene's points and questions and comments are so great, I think. The idea of um, building a 30 year plan is, or strategy is, is, um, is great, you know, because I just, I just think that's almost um, how we need to think that almost needs to be the mantra, because I think there are just so many, I think what's been amazing for me and what inspires me and keeps me going is just looking at what technology has afforded in terms of the building of collectives and the building of um you know uh, support mechanisms for people of of color um across the uk in the sense of you know you can connect to people now who you may not be near you but actually you know they're there they have similar views and blah blah, blah. i think that's been quite inspiring i think what i don't know about the resilience, I think that's really hard to tell because it's, it's such a different time um, and it's hard to compare. But what I would say is that um, I think the power, let's say you could call it the power that the younger generation have now is just that awareness that they there is a mass, you know. Um, and then for me, within how that mass connects across its collectives, groups, um, communities, individuals, is part of that 30 year plan. Um, and in a way, I think that's the important bit really. It's like, how do we hold and record now? Um, and I think, you know, almost we need to not, not completely, I mean, I work for an institution, you know, and I don't think we need to completely step away, but I feel that we need to find ways of, of establishing um, our, you know, 
whether we want to call it a safe space or creative space that we can, you know, that we can build um, and hold space that enables us to, to navigate more comfortably um, stand beside some of the more, much more established um, organizations. Elaine, just quickly. Yeah, just yeah. quickly say, I, I think, and I think you're saying this, Mark, I, it's not an either or situation because national institutions, after all, for me, are also part, I mean, representation is a dual edged thing. It's not just about the visual reflection of yourself and those diverse experiences and the collections and the institution, but it's also part of democracy, part of being present, the, 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 the distinction you made between attending and participating. And it's crucial that we don't exclude ourselves from that participation. We've got two wonderful comments, as I'll read very briefly, and one last question. One is from um, the fantastic Brian, Brig, Brian Biggs, who says, the specials on appropriate reference points. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> at a discussion event at Blue Coat a couple of years ago that I chaired involving Jelaine, Joe Stockham and Keith Piper, we talked about the importance of punk, but more importantly, two-tone, in relation to intersectional struggle and cultural resistance in the late 70s and early 80s. Interestingly, both Keith and Jerry Dammers from the specials had been taught by John Yeadon um, at Coventry Art School. These crossovers, significantly including the regions between music, art and politics, forged in art schools, perhaps demand more inquiry in interrogating the genealogies of black art and curating in the UK, rather than seeing these as entirely separate completely endorse that Brian um, great point um, and that's something that definitely want to explore and I, something that I, I am conscious that I didn't incorporate in this particular series it's very London focused which is very typical and very bad um, but it's something that um, I'm involved in another network looking at um, the West Midlands with Carolyn Carolyn Arito um, which we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about soon the other comment comes from Raju Rage, artist and curator, who will be actually in the next panel discussion next Thursday. Raju will be in that session. And they say, we struggle with the institutional art world, and yet we want to be within them or have them represent us. This dichotomy is often draining and distracting. The alternative to create alternatives is a partly forced activism to carve out our own spaces and a lot of labor, which can be equally draining and distracting. Um, though more often, though more often also generative in a collective way. Strengths are definitely collectivity networked connection. They are our practical, creative and spiritual resources. I liked what Mark stated about quality and authenticity and retaining that in the face of all the institutional crap that we have to wade through. I liked what Nima said about Stuart Hall's critiques as a weapon, but one that didn't cause violence, but manifests more as a shield, especially in light of uh, necessary protectiveness that we need. And I like what Jelaine spoke to around, to around the trajectory and lineage, in particular black, Asian women artists, and particularly finding ways to spotlight or focus on them without being burdened by the burden of representation. A great, a great um, uh, um, comment there, Raju, and we'll build on that next week when we talk about the curating, we'll build on what um, Marley mentioned is the curating an expanded field. And final question, we've got two minutes left, so very short, quick answers from you, all three of you, from Anonymous. Thanks for the interesting and illuminating historical perspectives, but I wonder about the current mainstreaming of artists of color by art museums and galleries. Do the panel think this is simply incorporation, jumping on some kind of bandwagon, or is this truly structural change? So quick answers from, from you. Nima? I think the answer to that is, I'm sorry to say, I don't know. I don't know. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Jelaine? I think we need to be mindful that we've been here before in the 60s with artists like F.N. Caesar and Aubrey Williams and, and so on. So always be alert to the fact that this could be, uh, you know, something which is symptomatic 
rather than structural. And we have to try and make it structural. Great, thank you. And Mark? I, I, I think it's good. I think it's, um, you know, working in an institution like Tate, I think there are many curators who are delving quite deeply on understanding um, and not jumping on the bandwagon. I don't think it's a bandwagon, but I don't think it's, it's either systematic change either. I don't think structures and systems are shifting that much, but I do think it's a, it's a good moment for a possible strong trajectory to something positive. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, I guess I'll just, we're gonna, just to end, I think obviously these are open questions, they're ongoing. Um, I think the ghosts of, um, of race, of colonialism still haunt our institutions. Um, I think that we will still, many of us and, and those that come after, come, coming up now, are still having to face this conundrum of ambivalent mainstreaming, of how to deal with that. I think the archive that we're assembling here and that our Innova, institutions like Innova um, have in assembled is really important. We need to have more of these kinds of discussions, more collecting more of these experiences of curators of colour um, in order to kind of like provide resources that can help us to navigate this. And I think questions around, I'll, I'll mention something that I mentioned in my essay um, that, I, that I shared that's um, around opacity and non-performance, you know, this idea of, you know, we don't have to give away everything. You know, there's certain things that we can, we can kind of create for ourselves um, and that can empower us in many ways. Let me just finally thank with the bottom of my heart, um, Nima Puvaya Smith, Mark Miller and Jelaine Tawadras for an amazing discussion. Thank you so much. This is a conversation that I'm sure will continue. I would definitely want to continue with all of you. Thank you for the audience for coming today and for your great questions. Next week, Thursday, we've got another amazing panel, which is focusing on curating in the expanded field around collective practices and the archival return with Ajamu, um, Umke Zine and Raju Rage. And um, and we'll see you, we'll see you then. So thank you very much. And thank you all, Jelaine, Mark, and Nima. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Bye.